slides to get through, and I don't really want to run over. Um, so I'm going to start off with talking about cat the cataracts themselves, then we'll talk about some of the surgery techniques uh, for pediatric cataracts, and then I'll go into some of the um, lens disorders they talk about at the end of the chapter. So pediatric cataracts can happen really in any way, shape, or form. They can happen associated with a sy systemic condition or isolated. They can be congenital. They can be acquired. Um, they're inherited or sporadic. Uh, autosomal dominant is the most common inheritance pattern, um, so we'll talk more about that later. It can be in one eye or both. It could be asymmetric, partial, complete, stable, progressive. I mean, it really can be anything. Um, so we're first going to talk about the anterior polar cataract. It's pretty common. Um, it's usually really small, less than three. A lot that I see are one to two millimeters. They're just little small dots on the anterior capsule, and I tried to kind of capture that with these pictures. Um, you can see here this little small white dot here uh, and right here. Um, one or both eyes, these are usually not progressive. We usually will follow them to make sure they don't develop amblyopia from anisometropia, but usually they're really small and they're not significant. So on your exam, you'll hear me say this a lot, and some of you who have been in clinic with me, I love the red reflex test, especially if someone comes in and you're worried about a cataract. It's really important in kids, especially for something like this. So undilated, you want to check the red reflex. If you have a good red reflex all the way around, then you know it's probably not visually significant. You want to check it again after they're dilated. If they're dilated and they have a great red reflex, then you have some other options uh, short of surgery for treatment. Uh, you also want to check for anisometropia in these patients. <clears throat> so if it's small and you have a good red reflex, you can just watch them um, every you know four to six months uh, while they're in the amblyogenic range. Um, if it's small and they have a good red reflex but only dilated, you can try dilation and observation. Um, you want to use something like phenylephrine. Uh, I know that's harder to come by, so tropicamide, because you really don't want the um, effect on accommodation for these children. So you want to use something um, of that nature. Uh, and also don't forget about patching and glasses. Just because they have a cataract, you don't jump to surgery. So you can do patching, you can do glasses. Um, and if that doesn't work or if you're worried that it's visually significant, then obviously you go forward with surgery. Um, just make sure you're following them closely if you uh, choose to observe. An anterior pyramidal cataract is just a larger, more severe form of the anterior polar. Um, it's a pyramid shape. It protrudes into the anterior chamber. Um, these can be progressive, so you want to uh, follow them closely. Uh, nuclear cataract uh, can occur in kids as well. Uh, they're usually about three millimeters, a little bit small, um, and the density and size can vary. These can progress, so you want to follow these kids. Uh, do your um, red reflex test. I recently had a child that had a unilateral nuclear cataract. You had a great view to the back. Uh, it's really faint, um, so we're just watching for right now because we don't think it's visually significant, and we'll get into later why we would really prefer to observe these kids as opposed to going forward with surgery. Um, these patients can have smaller eyes, and smaller eyes will put you at risk for glaucoma. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Your book talks about lamellar cataract. Um, I haven't seen these quite as much. Um, they affect, think about the um, layers of the cortex like an onion uh, with different layers, and then a lamellar cataract is a, a pacification of some of those layers, one or more. Um, they're a little bit larger. Um, they can be typically about five millimeters or bigger, and those are more often um, bilateral. And this is a slit lamp on an angle, and you can kind of see the, the op opacified area and then the clear center. Um, a lamellar cataract can have cortical riders, which are these little um, tiny linear opacities, and they, and they kind of wrap around the cortex. Um, the eye is normal in size, and the onset is a little bit later. Uh, these kids can actually have pretty good vision, good visual prognosis, because they develop their fixation uh, before the onset. Posterior lensiconus, um, 
I see this quite a bit, um, progressive thinning of the central posterior capsule. So basically the posterior capsule just has a, de a congenital defect. It's weaker, it protrudes, um, and you can see here, so um, on um, translumination, you see this kind of round, it looks like an oil droplet. So, you know, on your boards or on your um, OCAPs, uh, this is what they're going to consider an oil droplet cataract. And I had one recently, I don't think, um, who did I show it to? I think I showed it to Bren. I, I grabbed Bren in the hallway and I was like, hey, come look at this patient because it was someone who had high myopia. They didn't know what was going on and you could see the oil droplet when they were dilated beautifully. Um, and over here, uh, it kind of shows this kind of outpouching. Uh, if you look really close with the handheld slit lamp, you can see it. So these can progress. They may start out with a really clear lens and then all of a sudden they can uh, cloud up on you. Um, and these are the patients where they've been examined and the pediatrician has looked at them and then all of a sudden they have this really dense cataract and no one knows what's going on. It's because they can have um, opacification around the outpouching um, and if there's a tear that develops uh, because it ruptures, then you can have a total cataract as well. Th this type of cataract, it, it can be challenging in the OR because the capsule is just weak and, and you usually, you deal with vitreous a lot more in pediatric cataracts um, and this is one of the reasons. Um, these um, eyes are normal in size. Um, it, it says normally unilateral, but as you might know by being up in our clinic that I see, I've seen this uh, bilateral. I, I saw this just recently bilateral. So um, for teaching, yes it's more likely to be unilateral, but I, I've seen it both. Um, and again, the cataract may not form until later. So uh, PSC is less common in kids than in adults. Um, it's acquired bilateral and progressive, and it's a lot of the normal causes for PSC. It's just we don't see it quite as much. Diabetes really doesn't cause this um, that much in kids. Uh, I think there's been a few reported cases, but you typically really don't see that that much. And a sectoral cataract, um, I, I touch on this because it's, it's small. It, it's, a lot of times it's not visually significant. However, if you see it, you really have to rule out posterior pathology, rule out a posterior segment tumor, make sure you're getting a really good exam. If you're, there's any question, you really should get um, a B scan or something like that to uh, rule out a tumor. PFE. Um, used to be called PHPV, we usually call it PFB now. Um, it's isolated, sporadic, usually unilateral. So on your tests and the questions, it's gonna be unilateral. They're not gonna ask you about a bilateral PFB patient. However, we see it bilateral all the time, especially up in uh, Levin's genetic clinic. Um, these eyes are uh, microphthalmic, they're smaller. Um, the teaching is if you have a PFB patient and the eye is not smaller, don't forget about glaucoma. Uh, and this is a spectrum. So you can see it um, my, more mild forms. Um, recently I had a case where the patient was had a bilateral cataract. They were four weeks old, five weeks old, got an ultrasound. Everything looked totally normal. Surgery went beautifully. The next day they had vitreous hemorrhage and it was along the canal and, and they had a mild PFB that we couldn't even pick up on, on ultrasound. It actually happened in both eyes, but the patient did fine, but it can be mild where you don't even see it and it can be really severe like this patient. You can see this uh, posterior plaque here um, and you have the sublux lens and then these elongated ciliary processes is something we look for commonly uh, in working up these kids. Um, one thing, I don't, I don't think I have it later on, um, just a side note, any posterior uh, cataract in a kid, um, you could have a really small plaque, that way on slit lamp looks really small, but if you actually look at the red reflex, if you look with your uh, retinoscope, there's a larger, uh, kind of more abnormal um, posterior capsular uh, defect that is visually significant. So um, just because it has a small posterior defect doesn't mean it's not a more widespread issue that you can pick up on other te testing. So um, again, you can have the mild, um, more f uh, mild form with the large Mittendorf dot, Bergmeister papillae, or the more severe where they're really microphthalmic. They have this dense retrolental plaque, um, thick artery, um, elongated ciliary processes. Uh, you can get retinal traction. And the, a lot of these kids, uh, we won't do an anterior cataract approach if there's a lot of um, uh, 
traction or some type of retrolental mem uh, membrane, uh, we usually will send those to the retinal surgeons uh, due to the risk of retinal de detachment. Uh, there's a natural progression, so you'll get some anterior chamber shallowing, uh, the glaucoma. I've actually seen some kids where in the office they're totally, uh, their pressure's normal, and then between the time we, we see them in the office and schedule them for surgery, they develop glaucoma. Um, and they can have all kinds of issues such as congenital retinal non-attachment, ciliary body detachment, uh, vitreous hemorrhage, uh, and uh, optic nerve anomalies. PFE, don't forget, is in the differential for retinoblastoma, uh, so you want to get an ultrasound. We get an ultrasound, obviously, in every uh, cataract patient I usually do, um, just to make sure there's nothing going on um, posteriorly that I can't see for myself. Um, and one key difference is the microphthalmia, um, and those patients are less likely to have a cataract as well. So this is my who, what, where, when, and why of pediatric cataracts. And history is really important. As opposed to an adult, you just kind of see the cataract. You're like, okay, let's go in and take it out. But this is really important. So I usually ask, well, who noticed it? Is it the parent, a friend, a caretaker? Did they see it? Is it the pediatrician that picked it up? Um, and what did they see? Did they see poor function? Did they see nystagmus? Or is it something that was picked up on a routine uh, pediatric exam? And I like to see what they noticed. Was there some type of um, preceding trauma, uh, any possible mechanism, chronic steroid use? Um, and when was it noticed? Uh, is this something that was acute that might be more suggestive of um, a posterior capsular issue? Um, you know, clear one day, opacified the next, or is it more gradual? Um, and then you want to ask about past medical history, um, autoimmune diseases, something they might use, steroids for genetic and craniofacial syndromes, uh, birth history, something that you're not used to asking in the adult clinic. You're not going to ask if someone's premature when they're 50 years old with a cataract, but in a kid, it's important because they could have ROP and they have laser, and, and that kind of makes sense. You want these things to make sense so you don't miss something. Do they have, um, you know, torch syndrome, uh, failure to thrive, and this is going to kind of help determine your, your workup later if a workup's needed. So don't forget to ask about these things. It's really important. Chronic steroid use, family history, ask about cataracts, ask about surgery as a baby, ask about unexplained blindness. They didn't realize that, you know, their 90-year-old grandfather uh, was blind from birth. They just know that he had poor vision, and when you really ask about it, those um, details will come out. And then review of systems is obviously important. Uh, I'm not going to go over every single detail on this slide, but review of systems is important because it may determine whether or not you're going to do a workup for these patients in terms of the uh, cataract etiology. So anytime there's anything in the review of systems that's off, uh, usually we'll have them either see um, ocular genetics, uh, pediatric genetics, or uh, their pediatrician. So you're going to obviously check for the vision. You're going to look for nystagmus. Nystagmus is a really good um, tool. Uh, it shows low vision, and it shows it's probably been there a while, and it started at a very young age. Uh, obviously, any sign of strabismus, you're going to be looking for a cataract. So any of those patients that come in with esotropia, exotropia, this is why you do the full exam. You want to make sure they don't have a cataract. You're going to look at the pupil for any signs of trauma. Uh, inflammation, and if they have a large pupil on dilated and they have a small opacity, that's a good um, sign that maybe it's not visually significant and, and vice versa. And the red reflex, I love the red reflex, it can show you a lot, dilated and undilated. And this is basically a non-existent red reflex. I think this is from a metabolic syndrome, like a galactosemia. So, uh, Things that you can see on the cornea, clouding, can indicate glaucoma, Peter's anomaly, uh, any anterior segment, um, uh, dysgenesis, and diameter is important. If it's small, you're going to think PFE. If it's large, you're going to think glaucoma. All of these can go hand in hand. I usually like to say that there's no straightforward pediatric cataract. If it was straightforward, they wouldn't have it. So, you know, there's so many different things that can happen with pediatric cataracts. Um, you want to look for any uh, transillumination, uh, signs of, you know, aniridia, anterior segment dysgenesis, or trauma. And you're going to actually look at the lens. Uh, you're going to look at the opacity, where in the lens is the issue. We have a handheld slit lamp up in our office, um, red reflex, and look for any subluxation. You'll see this uh, picture later on in the lecture as well. 
And again, you're going to look at the different parts of the lens. You're going to look for a stalk. You're going to look for vitreous hemorrhage, basically anything that could uh, make this a not straightforward pediatric cataract. B-scan is our friend in pediatric cataracts. Um, you know, here's a nice picture of a patient we had. Uh, we anonymized it. Uh, and you see this stalk going forward towards the posterior capsule. If you're not sure, if you're out in the community and you're, you're seeing a patient and you're not sure what's going on, you think there's a cataract, they don't have a great reflex, don't forget you can always get an EUA to plan for surgery or do the EUA with the plan of talking to the family while the kid's under uh, sedation or anesthesia and doing the surgery at the same time. Um, but don't forget you can do an EUA to figure it out. Not everybody has a slit lamp, handheld slit lamp. Um, and you can't always really see all the details in um, with your 20. So um, don't forget about an EUA. Old notes are really important. Um, it really changes my conversation with the family. Uh, if they come in, it's a you know 15, 16 year old, um, and they had you know 20, 20 vision three years ago. I'm really you know saying you have a good chance of improving the vision here. Um, and if it's something where it's been there for a long time, you're just having a different conversation and prepping the family that you don't know where the vision's going to be. Uh, family history is important. If you establish autosomal dominant inheritance, you don't do a work. You don't have to do a workup, um, and it can be unilateral or bilateral in, um, when it's inherited. So it could be either. Uh, and a lot of times we'll examine the parents in the office, and they may not even know that they have a small uh, little hint of a cataract that might make you feel a little more comfortable observing, um, not doing a workup. So kind of rule of thumb, and it's unilateral, uh, we usually don't do a workup in an otherwise well child. Obviously, if anything is off in the review of systems, we kind of tailor our workup towards that. Um, you always want to consider trauma and child abuse, even if it's just a fleeting thought. Um, you just you don't want to miss it. So make sure you think about it, assess the situation, and then you can put it in the back of your mind. But don't forget to think about that. Um, bilateral with abnormal review of systems, it's going to be kind of a, a goal-directed workup, and you're going to refer them to uh, acogenetics, pediatric genetics, um, to do a directed workup. If it's bilateral and they're totally normal child, then a lot of times we won't do a workup. Um, but I think for purposes of your testing and for boards, make sure that a bilateral patient, um, it, you're probably going to do more of a uh, workup than with a unilateral, like on the questions. They'll say bilateral, you're going to be going more towards a workup than a unilateral. So the management is going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. I'll get into some of the details in a few slides, but again, small, less than a few millimeters, no sign of amblyopia, good red reflex on dilate. You're just going to watch those kids. You're going to watch them closely. You really want to talk to the family about what to look for. Um, you know, any signs of worsening, if they see something like a color change or something that makes them uncomfortable, come right back. Um, nystagmus, strabismus, anything that seems off, they need to come right back. Older kids, um, Usually 2040 or better, uh, we don't do anything about. Um, if they have a sublux lens, uh, but they're refractable better, we usually will watch as well. Don't forget to refract them through the um, aphakic and phakic portion of their visual axis, because sometimes you can actually get them corrected through the aphakic portion and avoid surgery. Um, So we talked about this. Make sure um, if you're using a dilating drop, you use something that has less of a psychoplegic refract. You want them to not have the paralysis of their accommodation. And surgery. For surgery, I kind of stuck this in here. Um, we'll talk about it later. But um, if they have a sublux lens, you really want to make sure they don't have homocystinuria because of venous thromboembolic disease that can kill them under anesthesia. So anytime you have a sublux lens, yep. It depends. It, 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 so, so if they have a sublux lens, they don't always have a cataract. Sometimes we have to remove it even if they have no cataract because we can't get their vision better. Um, it depends on the etiology, if it's something that's progressive, if it's something that's stable. We usually will just watch them frequently. Um, but if it's something like Marfan syndrome, then what I've seen happen is, you know, we will 
refract them, we can get them better through the aphakic portion, we give them, you know, correction, and we watch them, and as it continues to sublux, or if there's some type of issue, we have to take it out, but you have to take everything out. You go in, you don't put a lens in, you leave them aphakic, um, because it's just, it's not gonna be supported. Um, because there's not going to be a, you take everything, you take the capsule and the lens. And there's not, you take it out even if there's not a cataract. But um, it depends on the etiology. Is she a homocysteine in all kids with sublux lens, whether it's unilateral or bilateral? So we check for that if there's a suggestion of it or a sublux lens and we don't have a reason. Usually I'll send those patients for a workup with genetics, like for example, I'll send them to our ocular genetics team if I think there's a suspicion. But I wouldn't ever take them to the OR without knowing why if there's not you know, an obvious trauma or something like that. Because like I said, the risk of, of them dying under anesthesia and not knowing is just too much. I mean, and this is important, you know, you don't, because they, in homocysteinuria, they have a very similar look to Marfan's, as we'll talk about later. So the distinction genetically is really important um, when you're, you know, taking them to the OR. Um, so there's a lot of differences between pediatric and adult cataracts. I'm going to talk about some of this list more in detail, but, you know, technique. A, a lot of people do, who do pediatric cataract surgery use a vitrector. Uh, you don't really need FACO. The lens is extremely soft. It's really never, I don't even think I've ever seen a hard cataract in a pa uh, pediatric patient. Uh, some people may use bimanual or like an IA handpiece, but since you deal with the, the vitreous so much, a lot of times it's really easy to use the vitrector. You can do everything with one machine. Um, they're more likely to get glaucoma. Um, every child who has cataract surgery is at risk for glaucoma lifelong. Um, we don't know why. We don't know if it's because of the surgery, if it's because of the genetics, because of whatever caused the cataract. Is it the lens uh, proliferation that's proliferating in the trabecular meshwork? We don't really know. But these kids are at lifelong risk for glaucoma. So that's one of the reasons that if you don't need to operate, we don't, uh, because of these risks for these kids. Um, they're more pro-inflammatory, uh, especially when you put in an intraocular lens. Um, the refractive status is an issue. You don't deal as much with in adults because you're dealing with amblyopia. You're dealing with growth. Their refractive status now is going to be different in 5, 10, 15 years. Um, the intraocular lens, use, you're going to use it depending on age. Uh, in really young patients, we don't put a lens in. Um, and the eye gets really soft. Uh, I think a few of you have been with me. I don't know if anyone's been with me. The eye gets really soft. The sclera, the disulfide bonds haven't fully bonded, and the sclera gets really soft. So as soon as you take the cataract out, the eye collapses. And sometimes I feel like I'm working with a ruptured globe. So the eye is really soft. It doesn't look as pretty as the adult cataracts. Um, for the IOL treatment. So under two, uh, I don't put a lens in. That's how I was trained. Some people between one and two will. Uh, I think most people are uh, in agreement that under one, it's. We'll talk about the details of why, but under one, a lot most people won't. Um, I think there are some places where you know people will put a lens in anyone, but I think for the most part, most are in agreement that those little little ones don't get a lens. Uh, the capsule is very different. It's really tough. Uh, in an adult where you're kind of leading the, the capsule, um, you're pulling 90 degrees from where you want to go. Um, uh, in the pediatric capsule, sometimes I feel like I'm really, you know, pulling it really hard compared to what we do in adult surgery. Um, the posterior capsule often ruptures. You're dealing with vitreous a lot. Um, the vitreous, luckily, in kids is really formed. It's not as liquidy. Um, so you're not having as much uh, vitreous coming into the anterior chamber um, as freely as in an adult. Although I had a patient recently, a minus 15, she had a PVD that we saw on ultrasound before surgery. Her posterior capsule was just totally almost like not even doing anything. And uh, I had to use triessence for like the first time. Um, even though I deal with vitreous a lot in these kids, I don't usually have to do that because it's not coming into the anterior chamber because it's so gelatinous. Um, posterior capsular opacification is something you have to deal with in planning for f the future of this child. Compared to adults, you can just sit them at a YAG, but in some kids you can't do that. And amblyopia. So if you, let's go into some of this in detail. Timing of surgery. The younger the kid, 
the more urgent it is to remove this, the cataract. So a newborn with a unilateral cataract is the most urgent. You're gonna do that as soon as possible, hopefully within the first six weeks uh, of life. Uh, I think most people um, agree that you wanna do it after four weeks uh, because the risk of surgery is less and the benefit of the surgery is maximized. So between four and six weeks is really when we try to get them in. Bilateral, you have a little more time, um, so usually we'll do it around, you know, one eye, you know, six to eight weeks, the second eye, eight weeks, nine weeks, ten weeks. Uh, and an older child, you do it by level of function, amblyopia risk, how old they are, uh, and then in the teen years, we usually will say 2040 or better we watch, and worse than 2040, we'll go ahead and, and do the surgery. Don't forget to patch and give glasses to borderline cataracts, because you may not need the surgery. So we'll talk about the, the lenses a little bit more. So the standard is one to two is when you start considering putting a lens in. I usually will do it over two. Uh, under one, it's kind of not that great for those kids. Um, they tend to have a higher rate of complications the younger they are. Um, and those complications are things that re uh, can require uh, repeat surgery, like glaucoma surgery, uh, scarring, uh, dislocated lenses. Um, they have such rapid growth in those first few years that it's really hard to predict what lens to put in. So when we're putting a lens in in a two-year-old or a three-year-old, um, I think it's on a different slide. So when I'm putting a lens in a two- or a three-year-old, I'm putting in a lens predictive of what their refractive status is going to be as an adult so that they can grow into it. And they're going to wear glasses or contacts while they're a child so they can grow into it, less surgery. Um, so it's not exact, but you estimate based on the growth curve of the eye. And younger than one or two, that growth is somewhat more um, unpredictable. Um, a study looked at the implantation of intraocular lenses in children one to six months old versus using a contact lens and leaving them aphakic. And the really young kids had higher rate of adverse events that required surgery, like I said. Um, now, the interesting thing is, is that at a year, their visual acuity, by the grading visual acuity is those vertical uh, bars that progressively get more thin. Um, when they tested by grading visual acuity, the visual outcome was similar. But you know, the contra on um, the bad part is that they have more complications and they might need more surgery. Uh, you can always consider secondary implantation when they're older. So in surgery, we'll talk in depth about the uh, anterior capsule. So the younger the patient, the more elastic and, and tough that capsule is. Uh, it's more difficult to get a continuous curvilinear capsular axis, but the, the pulling force is perpendicular to where you're pulling. Um, you want to regrasp frequently. I, I'm constantly regrasping because I want to grasp right uh, where the split is. And uh, sometimes you can use the vitrector to do this. Uh, in a patient who, most people who the patient, you're going to leave them aphakic and not put a lens in, they'll do the everything just with the vitrector. Uh, you just make the interior um, capsular axis uh, with the vitrector. Um, and you don't have to uh, use the utratas or the, so you don't have to use the utratas. You can also use tripan blue. We use it, I use it in every case because uh, it just makes it easier to see. Uh, I think um, you guys, in adults, I used to use it mostly when it was a poor view, poor red reflex, but we use it in every kid. Um, the techniques for a lensectomy without an intraocular lens. So um, the incision, I do a modified scleral tunnel, so I'll do a pyridomy, and then I'll go about one millimeter posterior to the limbus. Um, some people may use a clear cornea. I was trained here and trained not to do that because those kids, remember we talked about how they can be really pro-inflammatory, and those kids can develop a lot of corneal vascularization. And I've seen a few kids with that where they had a beautiful surgery and then their cornea, they just have these vessels growing kind of into the area of the clear corneal incision. So I don't do that. I use a modified scleral tunnel. Um, they don't need phaco. Like I said, the lens is really, really soft. Um, it's important to remove all the cortical material. Um, we go out further in the periphery than most adult surgeons are comfortable with the vitrector because it's really gentle uh, because you can get reproliferation of those lens epithelial cells and that causes a big issue for these kids. They develop a lot of tough plaques. I had a case recently where the, where the plaque was just so thick. I mean, I went through like three pairs of scissors. You know, there's, the stern gills weren't working. I think I ended up using retinal scissors. It was just such a tough, 
uh, tough membrane. Um, and so they really, um, you need a few different uh, ways to remove those because they can be really tough. Um, the posterior capsule opacifies rapidly in these children, um, usually within 18 months. And depending on the age, you're not going to be able to sit them up at a YAG. Um, so we usually will do with or without an AOL. In those kids, we will do a uh, posterior capsulotomy at the primary surgery. Uh, and when you do that, you'd want to do a limited anterior vitrectomy. Um, when you put the IOL in, um, most people use the uh, acrylic foldable single piece lenses. I use a SA68T, although there have been some recent reportings of these glistenings where um, water uptake causes these little um, kind of crystal formations, and that's been suggested to maybe cause some glare later in life, so that may be changing. Um, but right now, I still use the SA68T. Some people still use PMMAs. Um, you leave the posterior capsule intact if they're old enough to sit for a YAG. A lot of times your primary exam and clinic um, will tell you uh, some kids older, they, there's no way they're going to be able to sit for a YAG, so you're going to be doing a primary posterior capsulotomy at the primary surgery. But some younger kids are really great, and you, you think, you know, within the next 18 months they'll be able to sit for a YAG. I always try to err on the side of less surgery. Um, we place the... Um, lens in the bag. You can consider a sulcus if they're older, but uh, the younger they are, the more inflammation, risk of glaucoma. So we don't try not to do the sulcus lenses in the really young kids. Um, and uh, always make sure you suture any incision you make in a child um, to close it. So the primary posterior capsulotomy uh, can be done in a few ways. Uh, the first is before IOL placement. Um, where you take the lens out or the cataract out, you do your posterior capsulotomy, and then you place the lens in the bag. Um, you want to make sure that there's no extension when you put the lens in the bag, that the posterior capsulotomy doesn't, um, you know, extend and um, have, you have an issue with support. Um, make sure the haptics don't go into the posterior chamber, and you want to make sure there's no vitreous in the bag or the anterior chamber when you do this. Um, you also can do it after IOL placement, which is how I do it. Um, where you put the IOL in, you close the anterior chamber, and then you do a um, press plane of sclerotomy with an MVR and go in with your retractor and do a posterior capsulotomy. Um, I've done it one time the pre before putting the IOL placement in someone who had had um, laser for ROP, and obviously a minus 15, I'm not going to go into the pars plana uh, for that patient. Um, selecting the appropriate intraocular lens size, uh, those ch these children have can have a large myopic shift uh, from age one to ten, uh, seven to eight diopters. Uh, it's very variable, so you want to you. We aim for the size um, that we think they're going to have as an adult. Um, some people aim for emetropia as a child to help fight amblyopia, but um, usually you can get very good correction with glasses or with contact lenses. So other considerations that I kind of just added here, um, good um, to know, in your anterior capsular excess, if you have a tear in a pediatric patient, it won't go around because the zonules are, are so strong. So I've had them go out before, and I've still been able to put a lens in the bag. It's just the, the zonules hold it up front. So you, you really, I don't think I've ever, knock on wood, seen it go around behind. Um, don't forget the eye gets soft when you remove the cataract, so you're really dealing with kind of mush. Um, and the chamber a lot of times will be shallow at the end of the case, so it doesn't look beautiful like an adult cataract should look, and it's a little bit scary. That was one of the things that I really had to get used to when I switched from pediatric to, or uh, adult to pediatric cataracts. Um, sutured IOLs in really young patients have a lot of issues, um, dislocation uh, of the lens and a lot of inflammation, so we try not to do that in really young kids, but in older kids it's something that you can consider depending on the age. Um, and these children have a risk of glaucoma and uveitis. Um, other considerations. We really don't recommend uh, IOL in a uveitic patient. They really just have bad results. A lot of inflammation, hard to control, and they're going to get glaucoma. Um, so until it burns out, um, we usually will leave them aphakic, and then they can get some type of secondary surgery as an adult if they choose to. Um, don't forget the posterior capsule can be congenitally weak. Um, or congenitally uh, absent. I did a case um, 
two years ago where there was about one or two millimeters of a posterior capsule, but there was no capsule in the patient. You know, just they were born that way. Um, we usually will do subconjunctival antibiotics and steroids uh, to help fight inflammation and infection in these patients and suture every incision. Assume that every child is going to be poking and rubbing and they may not keep the shield on. So you really want to prevent um, any problems uh, for the family or the patient and for you in the future. Um, if you remove all the cortical material, they can have mild inflammation, so you're going to use your typical uh, medications, antibiotics, steroids, and, and psychoplegics. Um, if you put a lens in, you really want to use aggressive steroids. Um, what we do is um, a lot of times you'll see we have them use a drop of uh, Predforte every hour around the clock for the first 24 hours. And so I usually tell parents that they're not going to be sleeping through the night that, that second night after surgery. They go home with a patch. They come in post-op day one, we take the patch off, and they start aggressive steroid drops. Um, after that first 24 hours, we give them an um, antibiotic ointment. Um, kids sleep a lot. Um, kids sleep a lot, so you have to give them coverage while they're sleeping. And this is actually great for you guys in the ER. A lot of times, some of you have talked to me or even Dr. Levin, um, and if they come in with a hyphema, don't forget they're sleeping a lot, and so they need coverage while they're sleeping. And you'll see a really big, more rapid improvement in their inflammation. Um, if you give them some type of either FML ointment, um, or if you're worried about a corneal abrasion and steroids, just give them Tobradex or Maxitrol. And if they use it while they're sleeping, you're going to see um, better healing, um, less pain. Um, and so these kids need coverage while they're sleeping. Uh, and uveitic patients obviously will need oral medication. So kids are not small adults. Um, there's things that happen in um, adults that don't really happen that commonly in kids. So um, they're not gonna get retinal detachments uh, as common. Um, macular edema doesn't happen that much. I just, I was talking about it with Brent recently, I think. Um, they don't get it, and whether that's because they just their eye is different, the vitreous is different, the surgery is different, or just there's the little ones we're not doing an OCT on. You're not, you know, doing that really fine detailed exam. Um, they do, it's not a big issue for us, um, and they are less likely to get corneal abnormalities um, if uh, you're not doing the clear corneal incisions. Um, Post-operative infection and bleeding rates have been reported as similar to adults, and obviously they're going to have higher issues with inflammation, strabismus, glaucoma, and amblyopia. Um, you want to manage uh, amblyopia as soon as possible. Sometimes I will wait until the suture absorbs if they have a big astigmatism, uh, but the astigmatism will go away. Uh, you know, the suture absorbs it and it usually is fine. Um, the really young patients, we uh, try to give them a myopic correction because their world is up close. A one-year-old or a two-and-a-half-year-old, three-year-old, they're not sitting in class looking at the board, right? So they're going to be playing with their toys. If you make them slightly myopic, it actually goes a long way for their, um, for their vision development. Uh, and you want to start patching if it's unilateral as soon as possible. The outcome can be influenced by many things. I think on this list, the biggest one is compliance. I mean, the, the compliance factor, it's hard. I mean, parents have other kids, they're working, they're trying to get breakfast on the table, they're trying to get out the door, and you have a kid that you're trying to work on patching, it's really difficult. But compliance directly affects how good of an outcome these patients have. Um, you can still get improved vision and visual outcome even if the cataract is detected later in life. So um, a lot of times people will come in saying that they said, you know, it's a 11 year old or a 12 year old. We don't, you know, we don't need to take the cataract out. But some studies have shown you can get an improvement. So it just means that you have to have a really long conversation with the family, uh, talking about the visual prognosis. And you know, it's worth, it's worth considering in those patients. So uh, any child that has a pediatric cataract, we examine all children by those parents. If you know that it's the genetic um, inheritance is carried through a certain parent, then you kind of know if they have you know, kids with someone else, you're going to examine those kids. Um, but if you aren't really sure who has the gene, you're going to examine all siblings. Um, all future siblings by either parent within the first two weeks of life need to be examined. And any future children by the patient needs to be examined within the first two weeks of life by a pediatric ophthalmologist or an ophthalmologist um, who doesn't specialize in pediatrics. Um, and you need to examine follow-up because a posterior subcapsular or a um, posterior lenticonus 
They may not have a cataract when they're born, so you need to establish follow-up and uh, long-term care. Okay, so um, now we're gonna touch the last few minutes on just um, a few things your book touched on. So congenital aphakia is when you have an absence of the lens at birth. It's really rare, and these eyes are really gonna be abnormal eyes. You're not gonna see a normal eye just with an without a lens. Um, spherophakia. Uh, is a small spherical lens. It's usually in both eyes, and they can dislocate. And I think I tried to show that here. This is the lens totally um, in the anterior chamber, uh, and these patients can get secondary uh, glaucoma. It can also be associated with different uh, genetic disorders, which we'll talk about later. Okay, coloboma of the coloboma of the lens, which is a flattening or notching of the lens, um, and it's usually associated with a coloboma of other uh, structures uh, from an abnormality in the closure of the embryonic fissure. It occurs infranasally, and it's really because there's no zonular um, fibers in that area, so the lens isn't stretched equally. Uh, so you'll kind of see a concave area. So it's not really a true um, coloboma of the lens because the lens forms on the outside of the eye and then migrates in. So these are just a few photos to show. So this is an inferior coloboma of the lens, uh, and this shows kind of the same thing, and you can see the zonules there are a little bit sparse. Uh, isolated ectopia lentis, uh, simple isolated ectopia lentis, um, the lens, um, the pupil can be displaced superior and temporally. Um, it's bilateral and symmetric. Um, it can be inherited autosomal dominant, um, and glaucoma is very common uh, in these patients. And then you have Ectopia lentis et pupillae. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. Um, I've actually never seen this, um, but it's recessive. It's in both eyes, and the teaching is that you see displacement of the pupil in one area and uh, dislocation of the lens in the opposite. Um, these patients, their lenses can be microspherophagic uh, uh, with meiosis and um, poor pupil dilation. So. More commonly, we'll see Marfan syndrome. So um, it's autosomal dominant, and their family history can be negative in 15%. So you want to remember that the mutation is uh, on the fibrillin gene on chromosome 15. These patients are going to be lo uh, tall, uh, long uh, limbs uh, and fingers with loose joints and the chest deformities. Um, I'm not going to get into all of these uh, different abnormalities. Um, let's go to the eye. So. More than 80% of patients with Marfan syndrome will have some type of eye abnormality, and lens dislocation is the most common. Uh, the teaching is superior subluxation, but in reality, it can happen anywhere. So on your boards and your OCAPs, you want to remember this for the questions, but in reality, when they come in, they can, it can be dislocated in any direction. Um, and the key here is for this picture. Um, they have unbroken zonules. So if you look in and you see this is a sublux lens and their zonules are just stretched, that's more telling of Marfan syndrome uh, because of the genetic um, abnormality in the fibrillin gene that just causes a stretching of the zonules. You can see translumination uh, defects at the iris base and poorly dilating pupils. These patients can be really myopic. Um, and they can have spontaneous retinal detachments. Uh, you have to be careful uh, in surgery because of this when they have a sublux lens. When you go in um, and you're going to take the whole lens, the lens and the capsule uh, of these patients, they usually won't have a, um, will usually leave them aphakic, and you have to be careful of retinal detachments in this setting. So homocystinuria um, is autosomal recessive, and it is progressive. And I'm going to skip over this. So they look similar to Marfan's. So they're going to be tall, uh, chest deformities, long limbs. Um, but this is a big difference. So they're going to have the thrombotic disease. And you have to really know that before going into surgery because um, these are high risk uh, for dying on the table in surgery. Um, when the lens subluxes, you have broken zonules. So um, I think I might have had a question about this, actually, on my um, boards. Um, they might show you a picture or tell you in your uh, question stem that the patient 
he's tall, uh, long limbs, they have a sublux lens, and then they'll show you a picture of zonules that are either broken or just stretched, and that's gonna, and they'll give you a list of, you know, Marfan syndrome, homocysteinuria, and other things, and you wanna remember that in homocysteinuria, the, the zonules will be broken. So to diagnose this, you detect uh, disulfides in the urine, and you manage it uh, uh, with uh, dietary changes. Um, wheel marchesani is basically the opposite. These patients are going to be short, uh, kind of not thin. They're going to be heavy, um, short limbs, short stubby fingers. Uh, we have a few patients um, who come from Lancaster who have this. It runs in the family, and all the little ones come in. They're kind of you can kind of tell by their body habitus. Um, and these patients are microspherophagic, and it can dislocate into the anterior chamber and cause pupillary block. Um, they recommend prophylactic laser. I don't think Levin does that for his patients in his genetics clinic, uh, if my memory serves me correctly. Um, and then the, this is the last one. Sulfite uh, oxidate deficiency, you have to know about this for um, your testing, but it's really rare. Um, disorder of sulfur metabolism. They have severe neurologic disorders, um, and you're going to make the diagnosis uh, with skin testing. And unfortunately for these patients, there's irreversible brain damage, and they die by a young age. So treatment through de lens dislocation, um, you're going to uh, refract them through their phacic and aphacic uh, portion of the visual axis, and you can test pre and post uh, dilation as well. Um, you want to do surgery if you're unable to prefer, preserve that uh, function. Um, you want to you can want to do anterior approach or uh, pars plana depending on what the situation calls for. You're going to do a complete lensectomy and remove the capsule as well. Um, these patients will use aphicic contact lenses, and um, in these patients, sutured IOLs have a high rate of uh, suture breakage and dislocation. Sorry, I know that was pretty dense, guys. But these are some resources that you can look for, um, that you can use, apost.org. Um, obviously, I give that to all my patients. And PGCFA is a website started by and for patients, families uh, of children with glaucoma and cataracts. It has a lot of great information um, that you can read about. And also, it's mostly for families. Um, that's it. Sorry, I know that was a lot. I was kind of going through so we could um, get through everything. Any questions about anything? Okay. Thanks, guys.